When, when she first left, it was very difficult for me. I spent over a year and a half fighting to try to get her back. And every effort I put in uh, was met with resistance. And uh, not just like a, like a shutdown, like I, I was concerned with, I don't want her living with another man, so being legally married to me. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're gonna move on, if, I, if I'm not the guy, you're gonna move on. I, I'm gonna not, not essentially support you in that, mm -hmm. but I'm giving you that opportunity, I'm letting you go, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe one day I can move on and find that too. Men harping on the fact that women should be submissive. Um, why is that? Why, why are you living and dying on that hill? Why are you living and dying on that that specific hill? Yeah, God, God tells women, you know, wives to be submissive to their husbands, but you realize that's not the the focus. Your focus as a husband, that's not your focus of that scripture. Mm -hmm. Women are supposed to apply that, so let her do that. Your focus should be on the second part of that in Ephesians, where it tells you that you need to be ready to die for your wife, like Christ died for the church. What's up, Bravehearts community? This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach, back with another segment of A Scared to Marry, wanting you to love fearlessly. I have a special guest with us today. Let me tell you about today's guest. I'm, I'm excited about this one. He is a believer, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a friend, an educator, and a servant. He has his own YouTube channel, uh, Harrison Family Values, which I have the honor to be uh, or as, as a guest on the platform, how was a dope conversation. I'll have that linked up in the description below. Bravehearts community, let's show some love to Andre Harrison. How are you doing this evening, sir? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. For sure. Had a great conversation with you on your platform. Thanks again for having me as a guest. Absolutely. This segment is a part of our series, Life After Divorce. Uh, of course, as you know, I have a heart for those who've been through divorce and those who uh, love fearlessly and decided to do this again. So I kind of want to walk down memory lane. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's let's go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about the, the the first marriage and how did you meet your 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 ex spouse? How did that how did that happen? <laughs> it happened at church, actually. Um, we were both attending the same church. Uh, I was I, think I, I, got, I was saved only a few months. And um, yeah, we were uh, attending the same church, part of the same youth group. Um, and uh, we we really didn't talk much initially in the beginning, but I uh, spent more time in the church and uh, spending more time together and we just grew closer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, it started in the church. Mm -hmm. The same thing for my ex and I. We we met yeah, in yeah. church. <laughs> yeah. so, so at that time, what made you say this was the what, what made you say this was the woman for me at that time in your life? Wow. Um, so I was 19 when we got married. And oh, you was 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met her um when I was 17 going on eight. Well, 17. I was 17 when I met her. Mm -hmm. And um we uh oh I just she seemed genuine. So truth be told, like when when I first came to the youth group, you know, new kid on the block, you know how some of the girls in the youth group tend to act. She was one of the only ones that didn't pay me no mind. <laughs> and I respected that. Because yeah. here I am, I'm newly saved and I didn't want my life to match or mirror how my life was in the world. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I didn't want to get involved with um, all the nonsense with church girls and them getting excited for the new guy coming to youth group <laughs> and some of them take, you know, staking claims to me. <laughs> it was weird. It was weird, you know, but, um, uh, so we, we, we became friends, friends like that. You know, mm -hmm. at that point I felt like I could trust her. Like she wasn't trying to like, you know, talk to me like that. And, um, I respected that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. like I'm newly saved and I, and I wanted to be serious about Jesus. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't there for the nonsense. I, I, I can do that outside in my community, in my, in my hood. I, <laughs> I wasn't traveling to church to to try to, you know, mackle some girls. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So. 
19, huh? 19. Mm -hmm. So let's just rabbit trails real quick, because I want to talk about this. Would you advise men to marry younger or older, knowing what you know now? Um, see, that's tough because um, people tend to make to, to give advice based on their own experiences, as if my like my experiences may not be that of everybody else. Because I knew I knew of great marriages that started in their late teenagers, teenage years. Mm -hmm. um, so my experience. I, I wouldn't put on somebody else and say, you know, no, never get married at that young of an age because you know what you know you're ready when you're ready. Mm -hmm. And you know you're ready when you're willing to be somebody's husband. And that person's ready to be your wife and they understand what that entails. Um so I wouldn't necessarily discourage it. I would definitely tell him proceed with extreme caution. And make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. And um, that that's something that young married couples must understand. And if you and I think also some of the things that they gotta factor in is oh, um, excuse me. I'm not yawning because I'm like bored. I'm like, it's been a long day. So but, but I'm engaged, bro. I'm engaged. <laughs> um, one of the things that people have to consider is um the family that that's the, the family that they come from. So if you have two people grow, who grew up in a single parent home getting married at 19, there's going to be some crazy obstacles to overcome because you have no source of reference as far as what it looks like to have a solid marriage, what it means to be a husband or be a wife because you have no reference. Mm -hmm. So I would tell people, you know, proceed with extreme caution and make sure you guys are prayed up and you know what you're getting yourself into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I agree. Uh, good answer. I, I know I'm I married at 24, mm -hmm. and looking back, I'm just going on 47 next month. I'm just like, I'm married at 24. Like that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and that's just from knowing what I know now, and and times have changed and stuff like yeah. that. So it is subjective. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I, I I respect that. Okay, let, let's let's get back on track. At gotcha. what at what point did you know that there was trouble in paradise in your in your first marriage? Wow. Um <laughs> I knew there was trouble in paradise when uh, she started to to dress differently. Mm. And in a way that drew attention. Um, it was at a place now where um, the validation, the compliments that I was given was no longer enough. And there was a desire to seek outside validation. It was no longer good for me to think, you know, to compliment and say things. It was it was needed elsewhere. And from that, I just started to see an unraveling, unraveling. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult for me to, to, to get ahead of it because it was probably unraveling long before I even noticed. Mm -hmm. You know, like most cases when we notice it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's probably or, or from the other side been unraveling. And when you're trying to gra grab the stuff that's unraveling, it's been like, you ever, you know, you, you want uh, to take a, a bowl of yarn and you throw it and you're trying to catch it so that you may catch a part of it. But if you don't catch it right at the, the ball of the yarn, you catch a string, it's still going to keep going. And you think you're doing something and you're not. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what it was like. It was like, dang, man, I, 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 I there's nothing I can do here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, eventually you know going through the divorce mm -hmm. uh, can you give us some practical tips on how did you heal and when did you know that you were healed from your divorce what are some of those practical uh, things that you've done to, you know maybe you could help somebody who's listening and watching because you never know what people are going through yeah so uh when i when when she first left it was very difficult for me i spent over a year and a half fighting to try to get her back 
and every effort I put in uh, was met with resistance and uh, not just like a, like a shutdown, like doors slammed in my face type of um, literally, literally speak, um, not literally, uh, figuratively speaking, but like no matter what I, I did, it just was not enough. And it got to the point where I, I had to say, you know what, this is, this is not healthy for me anymore. And I need to start um, focusing on myself and not in one of, not, not in that, you know, modern sense where people say, well, you need to focus on you and you need to do you. No, I, I, I started to seek God and ask God to, to build me up. And cause I was broken. Mm-hmm. I was broken. I was depressed. Mm-hmm. I was working full time at a church and I, I would, I would lock myself in the office all day lights off, mm-hmm. you know, just sitting there. Mm-hmm. Like I was depressed, depressed, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was lost. I, I didn't know how to overcome this. And and around me, I didn't have the pieces to help me as far as people. Mm-hmm. So um, I asked God, I need your help here. Like I, I, I need to overcome this. My self-esteem was, was broken. And um, it was crazy as, you know, during that time, uh, after the separation, there were women who heard about the separation and they were trying to give me validation. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't want it from anybody but her at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and and when they were like other women would come to me, right? I would I would see them ex- exactly as what I thought. Like, and I hopefully don't watch this and they think not not all of them were like this, but in my mind, I was like, listen, Jezebel, get away. Mm-hmm. I'm married. I'm trying to work it out. <laughs> like, don't, don't come, don't come over this way. Um, but, um, uh, I just wanted it from, from her. And it got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm broken. Mm-hmm. I'm depressed. Lord, I need you to, 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 to build me up again. Mm-hmm. And slowly and surely he started to do this. And about like two years after the work in me started to happen and God started to, to, I don't want to say release her from my heart, but it was essentially what what happened. The more I pressed into God, the more I saw that uh, this current situation wasn't good for both of us. You know, um, she moved on, but we were still legally married, and and it wasn't it wasn't a good situation. And when she had moved on, that's when I was like, okay, I I need to to really, you know, close this chapter because, um, I don't want, uh. I, I was concerned with, I don't want her living with another man. So being legally married to me, mm-hmm. you know, if you're going to move on, if I, if I'm not the guy, you're going to move on. I, I'm, I'm going to not, not essentially support you in that, mm-hmm. but I'm giving you that opportunity. I'm letting you go. Right. Mm-hmm. And maybe one day I can move on and find that too. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's what really like, essentially like what really, really opened my eyes was when, uh, she had moved in with somebody else, and I was like, "It's over." They're like, mm-hmm. you got to move on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that had to be tough. Now, were you serving as pastor at the time, or As assistant pastor full time? I was assistant pastor. Assistant pastor. <laughs> yeah, assistant pastor. Real quick, mm-hmm. as an assistant pastor, there was no one in your corner to maybe help help you through this as an assistant pastor um not 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 i gotta be honest not really because so here's the thing right um many many churches mean well many pastors mean well but not they're not really equipped to handle uh, a lot i don't say all a lot of pastors aren't really equipped to handle uh major issues in their congregation marriages Mm. I was given the cliche uh, tips, pray about it, you know, seek God, you know, um, things like that, you know, seek God, pray, seek God, seek the scripture. Mm-hmm. I didn't have the, the, the support, like, you know, this is what you can do. Let me support you in this. And that wasn't there, which is one of the reasons why I uh, went to school to get my master's in marriage and family counseling so that I could help couples in the church that were in situations like I was in because mm-hmm. pastors are nec- truly, if you go into seminary, they're not really trained extensively in the, the people aspect of pastoring. They're taught doctrine, 
They're taught theology. They're taught to, you know, things like that. But the people part is 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 not always taught. The the and I think every pastor should have some formal training and counseling because you're dealing with people. You're dealing with people. And I didn't have that support. I didn't have that support. Mm. So it was, it was it was a tough time. I felt yeah. alone. Yeah. Yeah. And also I didn't want to put much on on other people. So like I had friends that were in the church. When I'm an assistant pastor, I didn't want to dump on them. Mm-hmm. Know that I want them to to look at myself or her in a negative light. Because people will always take sides. Yeah. They always take sides. And you have some like I, I had some great friends that I don't talk to today mm-hmm. because they took sides. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they took sides. And that's a tough thing. Like when you go through a divorce, people are gonna take sides. Mm-hmm. And you don't even want that's not even like you're trying to get people to have your side. They're just gonna take sides. Yeah. And it's it's messed up. Yeah, it is. It's unfortunate because going yeah. through my divorce, there was people who took my ex wife side and mm-hmm. I was silent in the in the mm-hmm. divorce process, you know, and, and she had the voice. So got out there and things really didn't unravel. The truth really didn't start coming out until uh you know some years later. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I didn't have to defend myself. Yeah. Um which is a whole show within itself, right? Like yeah, yeah. to try to defend yourself. Um so I I get it. Uh, it's unfortunate, and hence why I'm doing these podcasts. Because I think, especially for men, a lot of times we don't have that safe place to go when mm-hmm. we are going through a divorce. Yeah. Um, yep. Because I, 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 I had a mentor tell me that also, like you know, um, uh, let the Lord fight your battles. You don't have to respond mm-hmm. to everything. Like let truly let God fight your battles, and He did. And God did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. a blessing. Yeah. So fast forward, what what does life look like for Andre now? Life looks like for Andre now, yeah. um, in a way better place. Um, I have seen God moving in my life in ways that I couldn't imagine, because uh, when the divorce was finalized, um, at that time the church asked for my resignation and I didn't have any degrees. I had at the time, uh, credentialing training, like, you know, courses I took for credentialing, Mm -hmm. but I had no, like, you know, I, I, and I went to Bible college for a year, but, um, it, I, I didn't have a degree. All I knew I was working 10 years as a, as, as an assistant pastor. So now I don't have a job. I started 2020, 2012 unemployed, a single father with the custody of three kids. And there's not a church in America that's going to hire a newly divorced single father of three kids. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I had to start all over again, bro. Like start all over again. I was almost homeless in 2012. And if it wasn't uh, for a pastor friend of mine um, who was able to find me a place, I was, I was ready to put my kids in foster care and go into a shelter mm-hmm because I applied for city housing and all that, because so, I had nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, and in New York City, there's there's not one shelter that houses father and their kids. All of the shelters in New York City only house, or family shelters house women and their children. And when I called them up, <laughs> they told me, well, there's no shelters for you and your kids. You would have to put your kids in foster care Mm-hmm. And go into a shelter. I was like, that ain't happening. Mm-hmm. That guy, and he got to move, and he did. Found yeah. me a, a small one bedroom apartment in a really nice neighborhood, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, where the boys had the bedroom. I slept on the couch for yeah. four years, and we made it made it work. Made it work. Mm-hmm. And um, it was tough. I was working a job, getting paid twelve dollars and thirteen cents an hour. Mm-hmm. So I had to get work extra jobs while I go to full while going to school full time. It was a tough, mm-hmm. tough, tough time. Today, I'm in a way better place. Yeah. Um, I have my own bedroom, my wife. <laughs> my youngest son has his own bedroom. And uh, and I got two extra bedrooms just chilling, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm living in a, a, a house that I purchased in 2020 mm-hmm. with a full basement 
full finished basement where I can have a YouTube studio down. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like li life is life is good right now. Like life has its challenges. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But uh, I appreciate where God has, how far God has taken me thus far. Mm -hmm. I look forward to where, where he's taking me in the future. And it's not like I'm asking for prosperity and for riches. I, I, I'm just asking God, do a work in my life that I may be comfortable doing what he has called me to do. And um, things are way better now. Yeah. Um, remarried. Um, my oldest son uh, is married with two kids of his own. And uh, my middle son is uh, going to be 22. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's living his life. So I, I, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Yeah. 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 That's, that's beautiful. Because, uh, you know, asking that question, it just, it just gives people hope. Mm -hmm. That. Yeah. Cause when you're going through the divorce, you just it's so hard to see the yeah. light at the end of the tunnel, man. And you yes. just wondering when is it going to end, you know? Yeah, I mourned, like I mourned. Yeah. You know, at night, I was crying, bro, like crying. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. un like the thing is, nobody was there to console me, but it was unconsolable, like crying. I remember I, there, there was nights I was like, God, like why would you allow this? Mm -hmm. Even asking the question, if you knew this was going to happen. Why would you allow me to marry that woman? Mm. You know, like I went through a lot, like emotionally, ups and down. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I and p people who are going through a divorce, they have to understand that there's going to be um, stages of grief, and um, people who mourn, um, they mourn the relationship that they have with the person who has passed away. They're mourning that they won't be able to see that person anymore, spend time with that person anymore. That's what that's what they're really mourning. And when you're going through a divorce, you're having that, a similar experience. You still see them, but you're missing that relationship that you once had, the closest that you guys once shared. You're mourning. You're mourning. And people don't realize that. Yeah. And because you see them, there's some things that you want to you want you want to show that everything is good with you. So you want to flex a little bit on certain things. And and I think um pe people fail in moving forward doing things like that. You don't want to try to, to show the, the other person how well you're doing. That's not the goal mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. The goal is to let God do what he needs to do inside of you so that you can move forward in your life after this. And um, yeah, uh, people really have to focus on on, on themselves and, and, and focus on God at that yeah. point and not trying to you know show the other person up mm -hmm. and prove how great they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll preach by itself because a lot of times people they that's the first thing they want to do is mm -hmm. look at me now, look at what yep. you you know that whole yep. thing, and that's yep. po post your pictures with your new boo right away, <laughs> and yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it happens a lot. I want to switch gears a little bit. There's a couple of questions I want to ask. Uh, no right or wrong answer. I just kind of want to pick your brain on some yep. of these things. Gotcha. So, what are your three ingredients? every marriage need to be successful. If Andre is making a cake, what are those three ingredients that every marriage <laughs> three ingredients. needs? Yeah. All right. Jesus. Amen. All right. You got to have God in the mix. The Bible says that three core strand is not easily broken. Mm -hmm. So if it's the husband and wife and God and God is at the center, there's a, there's a huge, and, and, and there's humility there. So you understand that you're trying to do things God's way and not your way then you're probably going to have a successful marriage, okay? Um, to appreciate the, di the, the differences in the roles that God established in the marriage, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's another thing, especially in, as we move into this modern day, yeah. I think people are not looking to do what God has called them to do in their marriage or be who God has called them to be in the marriage. They're allowing the world to dictate to them what they what their marriage should be like, you know, and I'll give you an example. Um, or they allow the world to twist what the scripture says mm -hmm. about. So I'll give you an example. Um, men harping on the fact that women should be submissive. Um, why is that why, why are you living and dying on that hill? Why are you living and dying on that that specific hill? Sorry. <laughs> Printing, gosh. It's is it loud? <laughs> No, you're good. All right. So why are we living and dying on that specific hill? Yeah, God, God tells women, you know, wives to be submissive to their 
the husbands, but right. you realize that's not the the focus, your focus as a husband. That's not your focus of that scripture. Mm. The women are supposed to apply that. So let her do that. Your focus should be on the second part of that in Ephesians, where it tells you that you need to be ready to die for your wife, it's like Christ died for the church, to love her sacrificially. Like that's your focus. And I think um, people are so quick to to use a scripture to to get a benefit from it instead of looking at it and say, what can I do to be more like what God expects from me? So one, um, keep God at the center, mm -hmm. right? Make it, make it about Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, two, appreciate the roles that God established for the marriage, apply it and appreciate the roles of the other person as well. Mm -hmm. And the third one I would say, um, is, uh, make sure that, you guys are compatible. Uh, compatibility is a big thing. And I'm not saying that you guys have to have the same interests. I don't know why that thing keeps coming up. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think every time I do that, let me thumbs up. I don't know why. I don't even know what's causing that to happen. It's all good. It, it just makes the video better. <laughs> it makes it better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, compatibility. And I'm not saying that you guys have to have the same interests. When I say compatible, I'm thinking of a puzzle, right? Um, puzzle pieces are very different. But in order for it to to fit, it's got to be compatible. Mm -hmm. Like you can't grab a, a puzzle from a different a puzzle piece from a different puzzle and try to fit it in a puzzle that it doesn't belong. It's mm -hmm. not compatible. The piece may look very different from another piece, but if you put it together, it fits. So um compatibility is important and and understanding. How how do you know somebody's compatible mm -hmm. uh, when they're able to fit in what you are, what 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 where your life is going, and you're able to fit into theirs? Mm -hmm. You know, I I love basketball. Um, mm -hmm. my wife likes basketball, but if she didn't like basketball, she could still appreciate that I like basketball, and support that. Mm -hmm. And if she likes soccer, I can appreciate that she likes soccer, and I can support that as well. That's what compatibility looks like. They have some couples aren't willing to be compatible with somebody. They just want somebody to conform to their interests. And that's not compatibility. So if you got Jesus in the mix, right? You put God first and allow that, allow him to be that three core strand in your marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, if you appreciate the roles that God established, the biblical roles that God established for the husband and the wife, and apply it to yourself and not use it as a weapon against your your spouse. Yeah. And uh, seek to be compatible in your marriages, you're going to have a happy marriage. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a happy marriage for the most yeah. part. I agree. I like that uh, puzzle analogy. That was pretty cool. I never heard that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, because, you know, they, they think um, everything's got to be the same, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like um, I'll give you uh, an example. Like when people, people use that scripture um, where um, to not be unequally yoked with yeah. a non-believer. Mm -hmm. And um, people, I think, want to, Put their own idea in scripture and just, instead of just reading it for what it says. The scripture says that uh, what fellowship has light with darkness, right? Mm -hmm. Light and darkness. And then it says, do not be unequally yoked with a non-believer. That doesn't say somebody who is as spiritually mature as you. And people add that to that scripture, mm -hmm. right? So they say somebody who's not as spiritually mature as you is unequally yoked. That's not what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. All right? Because... There's no spiritual level in Christ. Mm -hmm. Once you've given your heart to Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you've been saved for 20 years or 20 minutes, there's no hierarchy there. Mm -hmm. There's no hierarchy in God. So uh, we, we, we say unequally yoked, right? And, and we use it to, to show how more spiritual we are than somebody else. That's not, that's not showing an unequally yokedness. That's showing the pride that you have in what you believe in thinking that you're a better Christian because you may pray longer or mm -hmm. you you operate in a specific mm -hmm. gift. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what that says. Saying don't don't link yourself up with somebody who does not believe like you believe. Meaning, if they don't believe Jesus is Lord, if they don't believe he was raised from the dead, then you're unequally yoked. So so what I'm saying is things like like that, uh the puzzle piece. Um your your spiritual activity may look different. Okay. Um, it's biblical, but it may look slightly different. And I'm not talking about like different, like you're worshiping, you know, um, 
Allah and somebody's worshiping mm. Jehovah. Like I'm not saying it like that, but yeah. I am saying that when your spiritual activity, you're worshiping Jesus, you're yeah. following Jesus, but your 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 focus is more on caring for people, right? Mm. Uh, like the scripture says, and another person's focus may be on operating in um, the gifts and and worship mm. and things like that. Mm. You can you guys can still function together, yes, because the pieces are different. But when you put it together, it fits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's and, and it only fit if you're not trying to make the other person like you. Mm. You can't be the puzzle piece to try to find the puzzle piece that looks just like yourself because then you don't go together. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna fit. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, because too many times people try to make their spouse be like them, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. opposed to celebrating their individuality. That's mm -hmm. good. What advice would you give to singles who desire to marry? Um, vet. Spend time vetting. And uh, and if you want to want to marry, that's a beautiful thing. All right. But you you have to know who you're marrying and you have to know who you are before you marry. Um <clears throat> and, and and I guess also understand the motives for getting married. You know, why do you want to be married? Okay. If you're a woman and you want to be married, do you want to be married because you just want to have a husband to, to care for you? That's not the right reason to get married. Uh, you want to get married because you are ready to be another man's wife. That's why you get married. Men, you want to marry because she's a baddie and mm -hmm. she got the hourglass shape, thin waist, wide hips, and she got that pretty face. And you want to marry her because of that? She smell good. I smell good. Listen, no one, male or female, will be pretty and handsome forever. Come on now. So your motive can't be that either. Mm -hmm. So if you're not ready to be someone's husband, then you're not ready to be married. So I think single people really got to focus on themselves and, and trying to figure out what it means to be a husband and what it means to be a wife first. And then go into finding somebody that's you know that you're looking at married because I, I don't people aren't thinking like that anymore people date first for fun they date for recreation and then hope hopefully hopefully uh they'll land on somebody that they may want to marry instead mm -hmm. of going into it intentionally mm -hmm. and, I, and and this is a this is an unpopular take i don't think that people should be calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend right. let's talk about it yeah because when because today the titles are blurred today Boyfriend and girlfriends are expected to operate just like husband and wives. There are absolutely no 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 lines. There's I mean, there's no hard lines in between being married and being a boyfriend and girlfriend. In fact, you have boyfriend and girlfriends living each, with each other now, mm. and and acting like they're married, and and the other have expectations to of, of the other to to fulfill things that wives and husbands should be fulfilling. Yeah, and they, they're not even married. It's like and guys. They, yeah, and then wonder why they don't, why they won't get married. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, come on, like, there's no reason at this point. Yeah. Um. So I, I think um singles just gotta really focus on what they want, and um and going into relationships realistically. Um and, and try, again, like I know that we go back to this in this cliche, but really trying to figure out what God wants from a marriage. We let the world tell us what to expect. Uh, women want the the six 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 guy, yep. Uh, six feet, six figures, six um, uh, six figures, six feet, six pack, um, and they even added um, this is a probably a Christian channel, but they even added another at least six. Yeah, and, I, yes, yeah, my yeah, yeah, my, yeah. A family member was telling me about that the other day. I said, oh, I, I okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't know it either. Like, I yeah. didn't. That, that, I saw that maybe a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so another it's, six. It's not, I'm just like, oh my god. So now it's like four sixes. Either way, <laughs> um, and and that and they think you know, okay, we get that, we're good. We'll find a good husband. Mm -hmm. No, because you, you're missing the character piece of it, right? And with the men, you know, uh, finding a woman that looks good, that's going to give you pretty children, that's going to be that trophy. No, no, mm -hmm. you're going to be miserable. So. Go into dating first with zero expectations of the other partner. Mm. Okay. Two, there it is again. I think every time I put my thumb up, 
do not exclusively date somebody until you have made a commitment to see whether or not they'll make a good husband or wife. So when you're first dating, you're dating just to get to know people, okay? And make it known, I'm not your girlfriend, I'm not your boyfriend, we're just getting to know each other, okay? That's two. Two, um, when you finally make the decision, say, I like this person, and I'm going to exclusively get to know this person, mm -hmm. then you guys have a conversation <clears throat> about that. And don't rush into it. Mm -hmm. Don't rush into it. Because yeah. when you rush into it, you'll start, you won't you will allow the vetting process to, to take place. Yeah. Meet their family. Know where the family is from. Okay? Ask the, 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 the important questions about, and I'm going to say credit. Um, credit. Um, job. Uh, faith. Um, do you want a family? How many kids? Things like that. And have conversations. Because uh, when you get married, and one, one of the things that hurt a lot of couples in the first two or three years of their marriage was the fact that they didn't have communication about what the other person expect or what they both expect from a marriage. Yeah. And then when they get married, they're like, well, I thought that this is, was going to happen. Well, we never talked about that. I'm not even into that. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow. Well, you know, I, I want, I want kids. No, I don't want kids. What do you mean? We never talked about that. No, we did. Yeah. So have conversations. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, yeah, I think uh, the vetting is very important. Very important. For mm -hmm. singles, when they're trying to, to find somebody worthy of being married to, mm -hmm. I agree. That's that's good. And then we haven't even talked about like in laws. You know, what I'm saying? yeah, we haven't even talked about. You know, that's important too. <laughs> yeah. What what if, what if what if the what if the family don't like you? You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it makes it harder. It makes it harder. Every you need a community. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and one of the the most hardest places to be at is marrying somebody and then you guys are on an island all on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, that's tough. Now, mind you, there's some parents who are just difficult. <laughs> I get that. Yeah. And with time, they usually tend to, you know, fall in line. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's, it's getting to know the family and the in-laws is important. Very. Yeah. Last, last question. It's, there's no right or wrong answer for this. Got gotcha. you. Uh, who who makes a better spouse? Someone marrying for the first time or someone who's remarrying? Sheesh, that's a tough question. <laughs> that's a tough question. I mean, because you know, you you oh. you were on both ends of the spectrum, man. Yeah, I am. Right? I, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I I have grown mm. as a as a spouse now, and I've become I'm a little bit more patient. Um. I know what more to expect, but that's a tough question because I've been asked, would I have made a better, a, a different decision? Like, did, did I think I was too young to get married? And I got to be honest with you, I was ready to be a husband and a father mm -hmm. at 19. Mm -hmm. I was ready to be in a, a, a monogamous relationship with yeah. one person for the rest of my life. I wanted, I wanted to celebrate 25 years, 50 years. Mm -hmm. Got married young enough to Yeah. Oh, got married young enough to to even celebrate, you know, 75 years had we lived long enough, right? Mm -hmm. Um and it didn't happen, but I was ready for that. Yeah. Um, but I think my exposure to other men, other husbands, um, my experiences and me wanting to grow and allowing God to do the work in me makes me a better husband now than I was then. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, I would say I'm a better husband now than I was when I first got married. Mm -hmm. Um, my first my my ex wife because I was a 19 year old kid who had dreams of being a pastor and being a husband and a father. Yeah. Uh, now. Uh, it's not a dream. Now I know what to expect, and what's expected of me. In order for me a good be for me to be a good husband and a good father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It is something about that that second time around, especially if you learned uh, mm -hmm. for the first time. Yeah, because uh, statistically, most marriages, second marriages, in uh, I think it's like sixty seven percent. Then it goes higher even the third time around. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I I always like to just ask people that question. Yeah. Well, that's why I didn't rush. I didn't rush into getting married again. 
In mm. fact, when I first got divorced, I, I had set in my mind, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm just going to focus on God. Yeah. I'm going to be, you know, uh, a eunuch. Not, not really, not going, not going all the way. I'm going to be a eunuch and I'm just going, it's just me and Jesus. Me, I'm going to yeah. be Paul. I'm going to be Paul out there. <laughs> I know, but, right? Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, after a while I realized like I, I enjoyed being a husband. And I was a single father and I had custody of my kids and I absolutely adored my kids. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I think I had to, I, I, I was getting, I was getting remarried. I was, yeah. <laughs> but I just needed one to find the right person. So, um, it took me, uh, 11 years, mm -hmm. 11 years to, to vet and find mm -hmm. the right one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's about the right, right amount of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about that. <laughs> about that. Yeah. Andre, I want to uh, acknowledge you for uh, being transparent about, uh, you know, going through a divorce and sharing your testimony. Um, and I want to acknowledge you for serving God's people and yeah. having the uh, ability to uh to go back to get the education and, and in spite of setbacks and, and going through divorce and raising your kids. And uh, so I want to acknowledge your fatherhood as well. Uh, Cause you know, you only can get a snapshot of what someone has been through uh, and that could be so much more. So I want to acknowledge you for those things and also continuing to do what you do with your YouTube channel. Cause we need more healthy content and the things that you do out here, because the stuff that people say out here is wild. So Facts. Uh, continue to so true. fight the, the good fight of faith. So I want to acknowledge you for those things. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. All right. So uh, I have a couple of ways on um, YouTube. You can go to youtube.com or, or search Harrison Family Values. Uh, I, I think I'm the only one that should show up. So if you type in Harrison Family Values, yeah. um, I'll show up. And um, you can go to my Instagram, uh, instagram.com uh, or Instagram at at Andre underscore D underscore Harrison. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to my website, coachingbydre.com. And um, uh, yeah, those are the major ways to, to connect with me. Wow. Well, yeah. I will have all that linked up in the description below. Brave Arts Community, you heard it here. Go connect with Andre. As you can see, he has phenomenal work. This is just a just a little, little taste, you know. So go and check out what he has with his uh, content, YouTube channel, uh, I had the chance. Check out our interview as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah you, please link that up because that was a dope conversation. Yes, I, I appreciate it. I had a good time. Uh, Brave Arts community, make sure if you are watching this via YouTube that you hit the subscribe button. Would love to hear from you. If you are listening to this via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review. By doing so, it puts you on a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. This is Sean Heineman with special guest. Andre Harrison, and we are out. Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of A Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarry, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here, but anyway, go watch another video.